I, I guess I, uh, I've, I've got to establish some sort of a credibility here uh, for a start, because otherwise I'm just a person that's talking to you. But uh, my, my little company, Native Seeds, we're, we're, the, we're, uh, we're breeders and developers, we produce seed. It's all about native grasses. We, we haven't been doing things other than grasses, largely because we've got too many challenges with the grasses on their own before we start thinking about shrubs and other things. Uh, the, we work across Australia. Our office is, uh, is Melbourne, but we have production, seed production on nine locations in four different states. So we've got, uh, and we've got the largest seed supply of native species in Australia. And we've got a, a number of products in development and a lot of, lot of R&D program. Uh, my PhD is in agronomy, so it's, it's around this sort of work. But secondly, I was a horse owner. And I, I, had, uh, I had, at the peak, five horses in work where I was uh, you know, playing polo. So it, was, it was, was great fun. I love polo, beautiful game. But I know I do sort of share the, share the angst of, uh, of, of having horses. Uh, lovely animals, but boy, they're difficult. They've all got a death wish. And that's, that's my feeling about horses. I don't know that it, it just seemed to be that they're, they're, they're really those, those sort of problems. What, what I'm talking here today is about native grasses. And I'd like to start with a question for you guys. Uh, if you rate yourself on a, on a scale from one through to five, one meaning I know nothing about native grasses. I've just, this is the first time I've even heard them talked about, to five being I'm pretty good, I can identify the most, you know, all the species that we're, or the likely to be all the species we're around. It's just so I know where we're at with the audience. So, who, who, how many ones have I got? Twos? Threes? Fours? And fives? Bob. <laughs> 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 all right, so thank you. I, I, that, that just helped me. It's, it's not, not meaning to be embarrassing for anyone to put a hand up in any position at, at all. It's just really so the knowledge is there. So I'm talking about native pastures for horses. And we will be talking in this sort of order. You know, let's talk about the question about the introduced grasses. Oh, and by the way, Tracy, please don't use that word improved. <laughs> e ever again. Ever. They're not improved. Of course. They are introduced grasses. It's so not improved. <laughs> <laughs> No. All right, so, so you're, getting, you're, you're getting my bias already. So, so where are we going? So we're talking about the, the introduced versus the native species. Uh, we'll, we'll, I'll give you some ideas about the, some of the options for native species and some ideas about how you might go, go about establishing a native pasture. Now, the, this is the most hectic slide of the lot. So, you know, if it, uh, this, but this is a really definition page, if you like. Na native grasses are those that, when uh, Jimmy Cook and Joey Banks turned up, that's what they found. Now, had they bothered to get away from the coast and actually look at grasses, you know, because they were just hanging, lingering around the coast and looking at seashells mostly, they, they, they would have found that Australia was largely a grassland. We have the impression in Australia that this was once a forest, we have got rid of the forest, and grass has been put in its place. That's not the case at all. Australia is overwhelmingly a grassland. Now, there are certain pockets of the forest, but majority is, is a grassland. And so we've got a massive abundance of grasses in Australia. Now, just, we've got the highest rate of, uh, because it's been isolated for a long time, and an island, and it's been, uh, not in contact with other parts of the world for a long time. Australia's developed this massive flora of grasses. We've got 5% of the world's land area, only five, but we've got about 34% uh, of the world's genera, grass genera. So we're overabundant in, uh, in grasses. And they're adapted to these conditions. They've been through these things before. They've been through drought, they've been through hard times, hot weather, you know, the odd flood, lots of fires. That's, they've been through that lots of times. So they're really adapted to these native conditions. You know, they've been here for a long time. And, but what we've done, of course, is as you know, colonials, we've said, well, I don't recognise those grasses, they look really strange, I don't know how to grow them. Uh, so, and then graze them like fury, 
the, our early settlers grazed them and said this is the world's best pasture, but then buggered it up. But then they replaced them with mostly European grasses. And that's, they're the introduced grasses that we're talking about. And I'm going to start with the introduced ones. These are the ones we know, ryegrass, coxfoot, flaris, and some, some cereals. These are the ones we're probably really familiar with. And there's two pathways. There's the cool season types and the warm season types. And I'll give you more information about that. But the, 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 the shortcut to those two names is C3 and C4. There's a biochemical explanation for those names, but I won't, I won't bother with that. What, they, what these grasses all do, this is the introduced material. The first bit of their, their energy they, 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 uh, they produce from photosynthesis goes to cellulose. That makes leaf, those stems and leaf structural items. The, the next bit goes into what, so something in excess of that goes into what sort of a, a liquid plant store within the plant that, that really gives the plant all its, uh, I guess it's, it's stress reserve. And this is what comes out at the time we've been hearing about already, you know, cold, you know, frost to hot temperatures, some overgrazing, those sort of conditions where it's, you know, salinity, those, those sort of things when this su supply can, uh, is, is utilised. And what that is, is principally fructan. So remember, for these grasses, the ones that you'd be, you know, go to the feed store, or, you know, in most of your general store, they'll be trying to sell you this. They produce mostly cellulose, excess and fructan. And that's, that's the problem. And of course, that's a problem for a horse owner, but it's not a problem if you're producing a cow or a sheep. It's fantastic. Fantastic if you're, if you're doing that. And that's the problem. That's where it goes. So they're the introduced. That's the sort of stuff that you'd be, you'd be dealing with. Now the C4 grasses, the warm season, they're the ones that are active in, in the summer and, and dormant in the winter. You've got kaikuyu, cooch grass and those others like that. They all have the same, the same problem in lots of ways. Now, the native species are quite different. How this happened, I don't know. But you know, it's just that the, the sheer fact is that you've got exactly the same thing. These grasses, most of it goes into cellulose. The rest of it goes to starch. Different outcome, quite a different outcome. Not the fructan levels. And we're talking about differences here between, uh, well, 13 to 15% in non-structural carbohydrates for some of the introduced materials, 0.2% fructan in the, introduced, in the natives. So we're not even close. We're just miles apart in the amount of fructan that's produced. Have anyone heard these names? Some of these names are familiar. We'll talk about all of those as we go along. And by the way, uh, if, you, if you have a question, just yell it out. I'm, I'm more than happy to do that. And, and secondly, while I'm, while I'm going, oh, that, that didn't work so well, did it? No, right. A lot of this information is in this little, little book. Now I'm going to pass it around. If you want a copy, let me know. We can, uh, this is one that we produce on a, on a regular basis. A lot of the information's in there. Just take the time, pass it around. So some of the potentials we're going to talk about, I, you know, there, are, there are about 1,200 species of native grass in Australia. So we're only going to talk about six. We're, we're really cutting it down. The cool season types. These are the so-called C3 grasses. They they establish in the autumn winter period, you know, maybe early spring. Uh, they'll be, but if you're in the native species, they will remain green over, over the summer period as well. But they won't die out because they're native. They've been living like that for a long time. They don't die over the summer period. They might look a bit sad, but they'll come back. The first of those, weeping rice grass. Probably my favourite, probably is my favourite, it's one 
I've done more study on than any other, but uh, it's a beauty. Widely distributed, thick, full cover, very competitive, acid soil tolerant, don't forget about lime, you know, just ignore lime. Grazed regularly, sh very shade tolerant, high palatable. Okay, they're, they're nice descriptions, what's it look like? That's, that's what weeping grass will look like. If you want to actually see a stand of this, you only have to go about 500 metres or 800 metres from here, Bob. Just the other side, the other side of birdwood on the right hand side, uh, there's, a, there's a little, little, little slab of it being put out there. It doesn't get particularly big, but there is a large amount of fodder in that. And I'll take issue with something that Tracy said earlier, that these grasses do produce as much fodder as the introduced materials. You just got to find, choose the right ones. So there are a lot of very productive and highly, highly abundant species. See, there's a lot of density in that. Bale, uh, bale it or bale which one? All right, let's not microlina. No, no, I wouldn't be baling this one. It's too small. And the leaves are too too fine. They've got, there's some other types that can be better better baled than this. Uh, now this is a photo taken not far from here, uh, Cudley Creek, and. This is, a, this, this is a paddock that was sown in September, went through, uh, got established over the summer period, pretty patchy, wasn't a great, se great, great summer, not a big surprise. And uh, you know, looking a bit sad, that's April of that year. Uh, by the end of the next January, we had a full, you know, complete full cover. That so, no oh, that was great. There. Yeah. That was grazed, but you know you don't graze these things all the time. <laughs> you, you, you know, stock move in and move out. You know, there's, you know that sort of system. <laughs> so, so we, so what I'm saying is you can get that density quite comfortably. It was just the, the circumstance of the time. Yeah, the, 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 sorry. No, it worked out okay. The, often the, cho the choice about your sowing time comes to the weeds that you, you, you're competing against. If, if you're sowing in a window when you know your weeds are going to be germinating at the same time as the seed that you're sowing, well, you're just putting it in direct competition with the weeds. So you, why not pick the time of year when, you can, when it's got fewer competitors? And that's what happened in this case. We, we knew on this site that most of the weeds were going to be uh, winter, winter establishing weeds like winter grass or cape weed or, or uh, I think there's some salvation jane, whatever there. So the aim was then, let's, let's go to the other time of year. We can get good establishment, which is the spring, and we can, and we can have fewer, fewer competitors. <coughs> well, you know, look, we were, I, I guess we were fortunate we did it at that time had we done it at the same time last year, we would have had a complete failure. So, you know, it, it's, the, you know, the season sometimes knocks you around. So that's microlina. Uh, am I going all right? No, fine. Uh, wallaby grasses. Now, wallaby grass is really not one. Wallaby grass is at least 32. Now, the, the it's a, there are a number of species under that title. We just tend to call it wallaby grass and think that that's it. And they're, but they're all long-term perennials, highly drought tolerant, but the, big, the maximum size can vary. They, they can be biggies. Has anyone seen a wallaby grass that tall? Good. <laughs> uh, so there's no, no need to be shy in saying this has got as, as good a fodder are as much fodder as any of the introduced species. Other one? Bale. You can bale this. All right, so, oh, by the way, in, uh, if anyone gets a copy of the book that's going around there, there's, on the pasture pages, 
and I'm going to divert here because it's a bit of my my uh, my bent. On on the on the pasture pages there, there's some comparative data that's provided about the dry matter production of these species. Most most of what you get if you go to elders or um, uh, whatever, uh, landmark or whatever, is that they will tell you that the introduced species, repeating exactly what Tracy said, the introduced species are much more productive than the native species. You, I, I guess we've all heard that about 1,500 times, you know, and, you've, and it's just been accepted. This was based on really, really dodgy work. What 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 people did was that say on it, say. You know, it might, might have got a paddock the size of this room or you know, larger than that, which was said to be native pasture. And now, of course, this hadn't been fertilised, hadn't been aerated, had no, no other treatments, and it was looking really shabby. And then, then the, they sliced it in two, sewed, down, sewed half of it down to the latest, latest high production variety, fertilised it like fury, and you know, put a lime all over it, did, did the things everything they could and then said that one's grown like this and this one's down here and say look how crap it is. You know, that's native species isn't it? It's terrible. You know, and that's the quality of work that was done. And that led to that statement that the introduced species are much more productive than the native species. It was just bad work. But sadly that whole line has been swallowed and, and continues to be repeated. A friend of mine actually did the reverse. She, she she took a, a run down perennial ryegrass pasture, cultivated half of it, you know, let's put the other half this time, put it down to the latest variety of, uh, of weeping grass, going back a few, few slides, we, weeping grass, fertilised it, treated it really well. It grew this big and the other, the, the ryegrass was this. And I said, look, you, know, you, you, can, you can dodge the figures. But... <laughs> How does it? Let's not say it, please. Let's say, how do they? How does the native grass compare to introduced grasses as far as recovering from grazing? Because that's, you know, okay, it can grow this amount, but how, how quickly does it recover from grazing? That will, that will vary with the, the, the growth rate of the grass itself. Now, I, I, I haven't finished the slides here, but on the next few slides, I'm going to show you some different wallaby grasses. Now, if you've got a mature size that's this big and a mature size that's that big, you know your recovery on a small one is going to be a lot less. It just it doesn't grow any bigger than that. So when it, it comes to the, the choice of species and the choice and really finding some that are vigorous. All right? So that's, sadly, there's a, what you're repeating is exactly what people have been saying a long time, is that it, native grass, you know, lumping the whole lot together. It is, is you know, hopeless, un, hopelessly unproductive, poorly, poor recovering and very low nutrition. That's the sort of the bundle that's being sort of spouted around and it's essentially rubbish. You can make, you, know, you, can, you can make ryegrass, which is probably the most vigorous grass that I can think of that fits in this environment here, you can make it look terrible by grazing it badly. You know, you can make it, you know, have no recovery. If you don't, if, if, you, if you want to maintain a good ryegrass and make it a good ryegrass stand, give it a long rest. Graze it hard, give it a long rest. If you want to do wallaby grass, make it look good, graze it hard, give it a long rest. Same management. What's the long rest you refer to? How long is the Well, a long rest is probably in the order of 90 days. So you, so you can graze a lot out of that, but then then take the animals away, yeah. give it a rest, then then come back. So wallaby grasses, as I'm saying, they can be they can be quite big, they can be medium sized. This is one that was developed for uh, for roadside use by the CSIRO. But it actually works particularly well between uh, vineyard rows in Barossa. You were asked about that one. Uh, and they, although they can be small. Now, 
the wallaby grasses, we've, and this is, this is a very small one that's just a lovely grass, isn't it, Bob? But, uh, yeah. So you know, highly persistent, but but very you know this is this is local to here by the way, very very local. That's wallaby grass. Anyone think you could do that to wallaby grass? You wouldn't, would you? Most people would say wallaby grass doesn't look like that, but you can. You can make wallaby grass look look like that. And you would. No English you putting a, making hay out of that. Got larger leaf, you've got a lot of stem, you've got all the things, the ingredients for making good hay. But you know your hay is going to be high quality and not going to have sugar. All right, so, so we've got potential to produce a whole lot of good fodder out of wallaby grass. That's, uh, that's nearby to here, that's Bob up the top there. That's a different wallaby grass, a smaller species. Looks pretty good. You could make a combination of those. The third one I want to talk about is, is wheatgrass. And uh, wheat, wheatgrass is probably one of the most underrated grasses that, you know, that we have available. Really, really good. It's widespread in its natural occurrence, but you don't find much of it. And I think that mostly relates to the fact that it's really highly palatable. It's easily grazed. And you just don't see it because it, uh, it's just, uh, well, it's gone. Produce a whole lot of dry matter, rapid establishment, got a lot of, lot of characteristics there that make it really good. Bovines in this case, rather than equines, but that, that's, that's, a, uh, that's a little wheatgrass paddock and they did not lift their heads. That's, that's what wheatgrass can look like as a paddock. Not too bad. Who wouldn't want that? You happy with that one? That's at Oakbank. So nothing, nothing wrong with that either. That's a much younger stand, sort of the earlier stage, but pretty good establishment. That's a perennial. That's a perennial. There we are. <laughs> <laughs> loving it. Absolutely loving it. Sorry? Oh, yeah. Well, this one we're just... Uh, it was a photo. Op this is a this is a photo opportunity more than anything. But, sorry. So that's Porky. I'm just thinking my horse. I've managed to get her to lose some weight, and she's a little. <laughs> <laughs> so you know we, we, we've got a horse that's put her head straight down, again, you know, loving that grass. I, I think you, you 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 can manage monoculture is much easier than than you can manage, uh, in some ways. If, if it's a mix, you can just sort of set and forget and just hope. But if you're really, if you're trying to be, I guess, focused in your management, you might you might be a bit narrower. Keep fewer species. Yep. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it can be. Mm. You know, if you're trying to cut hay, then then you choose the species that make good hay. Yep. If you, if you're if you're going into conditions that are uh, you, you might be shaded or you know, whatever then, then, or you know that you've got summer dry or you've got uh, sandy soils, then you, you can change your species mix according to those sort of conditions. And you might narrow your range a little bit. The warm, the warm season species are those that, are, that get uh, established mostly in spring, later spring, early summer. They'll, they'll, they'll germinate at that time and establish at that time. They'll be actively growing over the summer period, and they'll go mostly go dormant when you come into the into the winter. So they're not going to give you any fodder at all over the over the winter, other than dry matter. If they're dormant, they can still be dry. And the the most obvious one of those is kangaroo grass. I uh, I think Bob's got a few. There's a few seed heads outside. You might have seen that to recognise that uh, the, this plant. It's probably the emblematic grass of Australia. And it occurs everywhere. It occurs from as far north as you can go to as far south as you can go. It occurs from east to west, through the centre, through uh, the Alps to the coast. It's incredible, the range that it actually uh, occupies. 
But because of that, there are many types. You know, it's all within the one species, but there are lots of different types. And there's some... You should, you should be, you've got to focus on a type that works in, you know to grow in your area. Absolutely. There's no sense getting something in Cape York and trying to grow it here. It's just not going to work. So, you know, the, the, we, can be, we can be fairly broad about where it's going to grow, but we don't want to be too broad. Because it's very adaptable, but you, you want to be fairly clever about it. So that's, that's sort of a, a green stand of it. Uh, it's grown up a lot taller at that stage. This was in Corowa, just on the northern, uh, just on the border, New South Wales, Victoria. Other seed production effort. You know, so people say you can't establish this. Uh, there's a lot of baloney around these sort of things. Uh, I don't think there's anyone suggesting that that's a natural stand. That's, that's sown and managed as a seed crop. It's all sown. It's not put in by plant. It's all from seed. It can be done. Windmill grass is a, it's a much smaller one. Uh, it's probably a, a, a biennial in the sense that it lasts maybe two years. It's not, it's not as long lived, but it sets lots of seed and, and you just get it continually recurring from, the, from, from seed. And it grows very quickly in response to that summer rainfall. And often, you know, it'll look like that. You've probably seen it around. There's windmill grass in midsummer like that. You've got these, you know, plenty of plenty of uh, plenty of fodder underneath that cover. Even though it's, you know, it's got the seed that that this is the seed head clearly, and this section over here it's been been mowed off. But uh, it, you know, around that area, you can see how much there's still green material in there. Red leg grass. Uh, this is the this is the true for me. This is the true uh, smell of an oily rag type grass. It'll just live on nothing. It's uh, it's just absolutely stunning. Uh, don't put it on sand, but on heavier soils, it'll it'll grow really well. Uh, has a very deep root system. Very drought tolerant, and interestingly, quite shade tolerant too. But in winter, it'll it'll do nothing for you in winter. So you've got to remember that you know, if you you've got to use it. Loamy soil on loam. Lime. Do you mean alkaline soils? Uh, if you are on alkaline, you've got a much narrower range of, of grasses to use. This will grow on alkaline soils, but it's not really. Uh, some of them are not adapted at all to alkaline. Once again, we're, we've sort of got the, we've got four legs, but that's about as close as we go. The, uh, this, this is just pure pasture of red grass. And what was intriguing about this particular property is that this is up near Tamworth. It's the Peel River over there. And these are irrigated loosened flats. This, this particular chap produces uh, loosened hay as his, uh, as his income. They had, a few, they had a major drought going back about 10, 15 years for, you know, it lasted, lasted for three or four years. The Peel River essentially became, a, you know, the Peel Creek. The, uh, the, so there's no irrigation out of that. His, his bore water just completely gone. So he had nothing. The only thing that was growing at any stage was this. And the red grass was, and it's on the hill. It's a stony hill and it was growing. It was active when he, he, he that's when I took this photo. They were still going really well. It was, it was stunning. This is, a, this is at a different location. The red grass here is looking very happy. Full vigour, really growing really quite happily. But do you think the soil's dry? So it's, it is just strong and just keeps on, keeps on plugging on. The other thing that's very obvious in this is that the seed the seed heads are tall, but the foliage is low. So it's a, it's a ground cover type plant. It'll, you know, it does a great job of holding the soil together and, and doesn't grow massively tall. It's the one that you wouldn't use for, fodder, for, for making hay. 
I include this as a, you know, not so much a photo about agroforestry, because that, but that's what this is. You know, we've got rows of trees, grass between that, grazing going up and down the rows. As much as to say, this is, this is red grass. Clearly it's been sown. If, if it was subject to droughting, you'd see it, the trees be taking all of these rows out. But the, you know, the rows next to the trees I really just aren't, aren't suffering. They're, they're, they're going just as vigorously as the others. It's really, really tough. Good value grass. Now there's some, I want to talk about, oh, are we going all right, Tofa? Everyone still, still with me? So Sorry? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. So how, how, do you, how do you establish some native grasses? How do we do this? Well, essentially you've got the same thing as for any introduced grass. So, so you've got to provide the, the same sort of conditions. But the two thing, other things to remember, usually the seedling vigour is not as high as the introduced species, with the exception, well, probably exceptions of wheatgrass and windmill grass. Their establishment rates are, are fantastic. Uh, and the seed price is higher. They just simply don't produce as much seed as the, as the introduced materials. By the way, I think in your show bag today, you all get a little sample. Well, I know you do get a sample. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, Bob, Bob's point here is that you know, the, the whole equation about the seed price, be, the, the, the seed price doesn't become relevant if you've got to continually, re, you know, continually redo your paddocks because they've just lost all population. You know, if, if, and this is what happens with the introduced materials on many times is that you, it's sown down in year one and then by the time you get to year five, the population stand has thinned so much that it's actually really almost bare ground again and you've got to go back to re-sowing. And, and, and the sowing cost is not just the seed, it's also the, the cost of the equipment and getting people to do that and, and also the time out, the time not being, not being used. And if you've got to provide alternative supplements or whatever to cover that. So the seed price becomes less relevant if you take a long-term picture in, in demand. So what you're saying is that you're saying planting native grasses is just one. That's right. Once you've got it established, you know, the, if you've got a, a native grass stand established, pretty much you've got it. Unless you really, really try hard to make a mess of it. You know, oh, look, I've seen people... <laughs> yeah, and, and that's, you know, with grazing management is, you know, you, it's no, no matter what you're dealing with, whether it's plastic grass or, or it's introduced or it's native, if you manage it badly, you're going to make a mess. That's, you know, that's, that's pretty obvious. I've seen people make messes of plastic grass by putting too many animals on it. It can be done. All right, so this is, this is a key thing. If you don't control the weeds before you start, you're, gonna, you're just going to end up with weeds. And you're not going to have anything other than what you had before you started, and it, it's just cost you a bit of, bit of time and effort to get nowhere. So that, that'll largely involve at least two, two cultivation efforts. Now, that can be chemical cultivation or it can be mechanical, at least that to actually remove the weeds and reduce the weed seeds. Bear in the mind that in, what happens in every autumn, you've got a bare paddock going into the autumn, a bit of rain comes along, it becomes green. Where's that green coming from? It's coming from seeds that are held within the soil. Now, if, you, if you're sowing grass at the same time, you're putting your grass in competition with the, the seed that's already held within the soil. Now the number here, the number to remember, is about 20,000. So got that number? 20,000. That's, that's about the number of seeds that will be held in the soil on that table. About a square metre. 20,000 weed seeds per square metre. That's the standard number that you find in a, in a pasture, virtually in all sorts of conditions, is that you've so that's, you, that's what you're competing against. Now, whether that be Salvation Jane or annual winter grass or ryegrass or whatever, it's, it's going to accumulate to be around about 20,000. 
And that means that if you sow what might be generously, you might be putting out 200 seeds. You're putting 200 up against 20,000. I know which one I'd rather back. And so you've got to do something to reduce that weed seed content. And how do you do that? You let, it, you let germination happen. You kill them. You let germination happen again and you kill them off. And all of a sudden your 20,000 has dropped down very substantially. Don't think that you can get it by just doing grazing. There's nothing there. Look at that, it's all empty. And I'll just sow straight into that. No, that's not going to do it. That won't cut. All you're doing is putting seed out against a multiple other, other, other weeds. Sorry, a bit inconvenient, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. How long do you recommend again? How long? If I'm, if I'm sowing a seed production stand, Kim, 18 months. Now that's because I I'm, I'm have to produce pure. Pure, pure seed of only one type. Now if I'm being, if I'm sort of a little bit plastic about what I'm sowing, you're probably talking several months. But you've really got to make sure that you get at least two cultivation efforts. If you don't do it, you're just wasting your time. All right, well, that's, that's either, either cultivating it out, spraying it out, or you, you can... Yeah. That's right. So you, 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 you're designating that I'm going to do this, this area here, I'm going to close it off. First thing I'll do is get rid of what's there. And I'm completely un, un, unfazed whether it's mechanical, whether you do it by, by you know, get a rotary hoe in and whatever, you know, or, or you do it by chemical means. Doesn't worry me at all. Uh, you can do it by combinations of all of those. You know, the, the organic people amongst us will choose one method. The guys who, those who don't care will choose another. It doesn't worry me at all. Is there a problem if you, if you spray it out, you've got a whole lot of dead whatever, is that going to decrease the germination? If you do nothing about it, yes, it will. Mm. Right? If, if you... If you just let the dead, the, that, what was green material, just fall to the surface and just be, be there and you do nothing about it, that will prevent germination in that area. So basically you have to do some sort of physical... Yes, you've got to remove that. Oh, remove it or give it in. Yes. Yeah. It's inconvenient, isn't it? <laughs> Oh, it sounds like pretty something robust, yeah. <laughs> yeah they, they, you're talking about a long-term residual herbicide and they can have, yeah, they can be pretty harsh. Are you talking glyphosate in the lot? Or glyphosate's fine. It, it, I, I wouldn't live on glyphosate. Uh, so, you now there's the other in, inconvenient thing of that is no stocking. Don't put the stock in them straight away. They're just going to kill it. So what's the point? No. no make, the, the first thing I would always, I always suggest to people is make sure that it, whatever the, your, your chosen species or group of species, let them run to seed. Let them run to seed, drop that seed on the ground, and then you can put some stock in. Depends on your timing. It can be shorter than six months too. Uh, so if, if, you were, if you were to sow, for example, in September and you had reasonable establishment, it'll probably run to seed in January and then, then you're in grazing in, in February. So that's, that's five months, I think. September, October, November, December, January. You know, five months. Uh, if, you, if you have irrigation, you can change that again. You can reduce that. It sometimes might be longer. If, if you sow in, in April, then then you let it run through to December for, for, for seeding, so it's slightly longer. And uh, you know, my, my pet aversion here is set stocking. Do you know what I mean by set stocking? Yeah, one, pad, one, one paddock, all the stock 
overtime access, full time access. Like, set stocking is the, probably the worst way to manage any, any pasture, be it introduced or native. But it's just a complete and utter way to, well, it's a way to wreck things. Because clearly what's going to happen is the animal will choose the most palatable. And they'll, they'll eat that out and they'll leave, they'll leave the least palatable till ultimately you get with only the most unpalatable in the paddock. And, and that's, you know, that's when you sort of tear your hair out and say, I can't do anything. All right, sowing. Well, you can use conventional seed method, methods. So you know, that, what I'm talking about is some equipment there. And I'll show you some nice pictures later on if we get some equipment. Bury the seed. Don't leave it on the surface. Seed's got to be buried, but not very much. Yeah, you're really only talking five to 10 mil. Uh, make sure it's got moisture. Don't put, if it's a native species, don't bother with fertilizer and don't bother with lime. Now, save, you know, the money you've saved on that, spend on more seed. The more, the more numbers you get in, the better you are. People, people have some, have, have the sort of notion that native species uh, will die if you put fertilizer on them. You know, has anyone heard that? Yep. Yeah, that's just rubbish. Like most of these things that are peddled out, they're just wrong. The, the, the native species that I've been growing, and you've seen photos, they, they all love to get fertilized. Ah, no, that's wrong too. But the, and most of that comes back to uh, the nursery system where people have grown, I think it's azaleas, that are negative, you know, negative to phosphorus. If you put phosphorus on them, they, they, they die. And people have said, oh, native species die when you put fertilizer on them. No. So with your fertilizer after it's established, they aren't the same? Effect. Don't put it here. I, I'm happy to put fertilizer on once they're established. Don't put it on out sowing. So the, this is some of the uh, how to do it that I'm, that I'm going to uh, just throw in here. Some, some of the things, how, how do we go about this? You know, because you've heard a compelling story from Tracy you know, and, other, you know, and I've hopefully given you a bit of a story about some of the species. So how do we do it? Uh, you can do it either by directly sowing them, you can do it from recruitment, which is I think the point you were trying to get at, or you can do a combination of those two things. And each case is going to be slightly different, but you need to just sort of get some general pr principles. And I'll give you some examples here of some things we've done. This is to give you confidence that it can actually be done. All right, let's start. Now these are, of course, in many cases seed crops, but the same story applies. There's a wallaby grass crop. Now that, that's a paddock of ryegrass, brome, chicory, clover, cow food. Dairy pasture. Please don't put a horse on it. No. Wonderful, wonderful. They want to go on. Sorry. They want to go on. Oh, they'd love to, wouldn't they? Wouldn't they blow up though? <laughs> so, you know, that this is a place purchased entirely for seed production in a in a quite wet area of Victoria. So that's October two thousand and seven, February oh nine. Now there's a big gap. There's a big gap because we did a lot of, lot of weed control, a lot of operations to get, you know, reduce our weed seed burden. We've got wallaby grass. May 09, wallaby grass. That's all wallaby grass on the, in the floor. January 10, harvesting time. Can be done. You now it's not, not too small either. You know, in, in a sense, it's, this is paddock, paddock scale. We're dealing with, that can be done. The second one, wheatgrass establishment at Holbrook. You know, anyone know where Holbrook is? Just, so go from Albury around about an hour and a half further north. March 02, you know, it had been prepared well before, before sowing. Uh, sown in July. So that's what it looked like just after sowing. So we've sown it in rows. You may be able to spot it, but now this, can you see seedlings? So this is wheatgrass. Uh, 
uh, September growing, starting to get a bit of a hint that there's green lines. Looking, you know, pretty dry summer, but they're, they're still, still lingering pretty happily. August, in they go. As I said, they didn't lift their heads. January 04, looking, looking excellent. All, it's doable. That's the point I'm trying to get at here. This is doable. But you've got to be careful. You've got to be, you know, you've got to be patient. And you've got to take time you know, to, to make it right. South Gippsland. So clearly weed control beforehand. All, it's all good. It's all been cultivated in. See the rows emerging? A bit of wind. This is the, the yellow, you, know, you can see the rows there. The yellow ones are winter grass, so I wasn't too worried about that. Just a short term annual. Same, so we get that right. We, we're going to confirm we've got, we've got the same power pole and a few couple of trees there. Power pole, you got the same place? <laughs> so, so, it, <laughs> so what, what, what we've clearly done, we've got a grass that grows above the weeds. In which case, I'm, in this case, I'm not at all concerned about the weeds because I knew, knew I had some manual winter grass, but I'm, I'm thinking, well, wheat grass is just simply going to grow above it. There it is. Oh, this is a trick. This particular reason, this peg here and that peg there, any time you sow, just put a row in the paddock. Somewhere it's convenient, somewhere it's nice for you to just hop out of the car or just walk over to, and say, I know between those two pegs, I sowed this grass quite heavily. So I can, I can simply walk. I didn't have to go around the paddock on my hands and knees just hoping that I could find seedlings. I could go to this spot. That's all I did, just go in there and say, oh, it's germinated, beauty. Really. Or now I know that the, the, the plants are that big so I've, because I've got a reference pot. Simple trick, but gee, it makes your life easy. December, not too bad. Happy with that? Nice grass. April, we've, uh, we've harvested it for seed. We've cut it for hay and rolled that hay. And what I've got coming back now is just 100% wheatgrass. We put the horses in at that point. And soon after that. Kangaroo grass. Sown in rows, uh, growing up quite happily. Another month, growing up, bigger, same crop. And I didn't hire a pygmy for the day. That's, that's, <laughs> that's, that's so that's, so he'd say, uh, you know, it's just a, it's a fairly big, big species. This is the one that uh, is highly regarded for, for uh, horse fodder, and I think Bob will talk about that later today. Uh, but that's not, all right, so after that point, this is a warm season grass. After that point, it's pretty much going to go dormant. This is a corolla and a coral where they get some pretty heavy frosts. And over the winter, it's just fully dormant. The paddock next door was, was loosened. So the, the, in this case, it was sheep. We're, we're given access to both the, the stubble, you know, that material there, just left, left standing, not cut, it was left standing. So they, that's, the, that's the loosened paddock there in this photo. They were just had access to both. So they had, they had dry matter and they had you know, nice soft protein, if you like, from the, uh, from the loosen. And the, the stock just chose to, to eat, eat it down. How do you manage that? As to, how do you know, because that's dormant. How much do you allow them to munch? At what stage do you go, OK, that's munched down. I can't put it. I have to move on. I, I would, yeah, that was it. We'd, we so got, that would be as much as you that, do. Yes, that's right. Any lower than that, they'd be starting to do damage. Oh yeah, yeah, horse could. They you know, with dentition's very similar in a horse and a sheep, so you, you, you've got the same thing. We, you know, for us, we could come along and control weeds at that point, which was really quite nice. 
we can we can control weeds, get rid of that. We got our seed production stand back. Yeah, pretty much. Weeping rice grass, um, spring sown. So you know, we, we chose spring again for all the reasons I was mentioning earlier. That we had a whole lot of winter weeds in this place, so we chose to go to spring. A couple of months later. That's yes. Yeah, that was so. That was sprayed probably. Uh, I think in this case it was probably sprayed about three times, but there was also a cultivation process, you know, mechanical, to stir it up. Aeration. Yeah, that's very important. But you know, if you get a good grass cover, then that'll do a lot of the aeration for you too. And, uh, so that growing to that, a bit more water, a little bit later we had, uh, had a rainfall event. That's not just bad irrigation, that's just rainfall. But it was growing pretty strongly and pretty weed free. It is doable. That's the point I'm getting at. You know, it's not too hard, just got a plan. So my recipe, you don't have to write this down. But you know, the, Five part weeds control, one part soil preparation. Pretty obvious, but you know, let's see my emphasis. Get, make sure you've got good quality seed. You get what you pay for. Now you can buy rubbish seed from anyone at a cheap price. Seed application, we'll talk a bit about that. More weed control. Make sure you know what you're dealing with. More weed control. And then patience. If you don't get those things together, then you're just not going to have it. You need to be, you need to be thinking about all of the processes that are involved here. Just going out tomorrow and saying, oh gee, I've got, a, uh, I've got a graze down paddock that I could just throw seed into and I'm bound to get a great result. You're not going to get it because you haven't done these things. Yes, depending on the weeds you're dealing with. That's a really vague answer, but I, I can't answer your question without more detail. All right, some sowing equipment. Now, if this, is there, we've got people here that consider themselves farmers in some ways, what I'd say, and, and, and most farmers get hung up on boys' toys, just toys. You know, and, and this comes down to the question is, I need some equipment to do this for me. Am I right there? You know, this sort of, you've heard this, I've got to get something that's going to do it even, even we've got one? Got a boys toy player? <laughs> Perfect. Now, if, even if you've got an area this big to sew, I've got to get a bit of equipment, otherwise I won't sew it accurately. So that, so I'm, now I'm, this is to, to pander to those people, all right? So I'm giving you some details of, um, so tell, tell me if you're happy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you're going to have to buy some new equipment. <laughs> yeah. All right, so, so the, the first bit of equipment here that I'll give you is probably the one most useful. The one I've done more sewing with than anything else that of all of the bits of equipment that I've seen. No. That's, I, I've sown hectares and hectares and hectares of seed by this method and it works really well. Just feed those chooks. Don't get hung up on equipment. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, this, 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 is, this is just, you know, some people sadly you know, think that they can't sow large areas by this with any uniformity. You, you can. You can get a lot of seed out. You can get a lot of seed in, as long as you take care. Oh, this is, and, yeah, yeah, I'd like, yeah. So the, the next thing you'll do is drive around with, uh, with you know, your kid in the ute driving and, you know, with dragging a, a, a dragging a rake of some kind. Or you, you could get a, a, an old gate, a bit of, bit of weld mesh, a weld mesh with a couple of logs on it. Just something, turn it over. 
get the seed buried below the surface. You don't have to have specific, you know, really clever equipment. You don't have to have that. Now I'll show you some clever equipment, but we haven't had necessarily better results with that than we've had with this. This is one we, we do a lot of sowing with that we use for a lot of our crops. Clearly we, we've got a row crop type mentality. Uh, so you, you can, what we're dealing with is a, a, a cutter, the seed dropping down the chute, and a roll. It's, it just looks a bit bigger than that. So you've got that, that sort of methodology. That was our first one, which was not particularly advanced either. Just a basic frame with a little couple of vegetable type cedars that were within that. Uh, another version's here, we've just got little, little, little wheels inside a bin to, to sew this. We're not talking elaborate, are we? Uh, yeah, the, yeah uh, these were around about 250 to 300 between rows. I'm not uncomfortable with that. Now, if you want to go closer, by all means. I attended a field day in the hills here somewhere, I can't remember where it was, uh, around about oh, okay, a decade ago or something like that. And there were people throwing around different equipment. And this was, now we're starting to get really elaborate, aren't we? Not necessarily going to do a good job. Won't do any better than the hands, but it might, might make it a bit easier on the walking. Another little version here, which was clearly going to rely on, on having really small seeds. Another one here, just simply, all it, all it did was chuck the seed in the, in, the, in the guts of that, and as you roll around, seed falls out the holes. Then you've got to come along with the burying process. Yeah. We, we sowed one of our crops with this, and uh, that's actually sowing, sowing our crop. It's Mitchell grass we were sowing in this case. I don't expect anyone's going to be doing that on paddocks the size you're probably dealing with. That's cotton. That's the equipment used for sowing cotton. And we, used, we just adopted that entirely for, for, for Mitchell grass. And it worked beautifully. Yeah. That's burying, yeah, it's just... And the very last section I want to talk about today here is this one. If you've got some native grass, what do you do? If you've got some there that you've identified as the species that you actually want to keep, what do you do? And if, if you've got some there, how do you, how do you, you know, and the process of recruitment is what we, you know, we call using that as your parent plant, getting some seed to fall and recruiting new plants for the next generation. This is a great way, of course, because you've got the plants there already, it's cheap. You just, you just need to grow them and use the seed that's already there and, 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 and get them moving on. But if you, uh, let, me, let me say that the two greatest lessons I've, you know, probably the one simple greatest lesson I've had in this space was when I had a wallaby grass crop. And you can imagine that we've got a crop of many hectares there and, and for whatever reason, and I won't go into it because it still hurts me, we missed the harvest. And there was a layer that deep of seed between the rows. And I'm thinking, oh, can I vacuum it? Can I sweep it? Can I, I'm thinking all this stuff, but there's, of course there's, there's foliage up around here and it's just, it's just impossible. So I just had to sort of suck it up, I guess, and just put up with the fact that I'd lost that seed cost a lot of money, but anyway, let's leaving that aside, I thought, well, at least next year I know I'm going to have to have a full stand and I'm, I'm not going to be too worried about it. Uh, of course, next year came along, uh, germinating in, you know, I'm, I'm in there at autumn, just waiting for all the germination, and I didn't get one seedling. Despite the fact that a lot of seed fall to the ground, all that seed was lost. Now, it, it was lost because it blew away, it washed away, ants took it away. I did nothing. 
I did nothing to actually change the conditions and I just lost that seat. So that, that just kept repeating to me that if I do nothing, I'm not going to get recruitment. You need to do something. So the first thing is you've got to recognise what your target species is. And you've got to, got to know when it's, when, it, when it's producing seed and you've got to know when it's producing good seed, not just that. So you've got to be checking the seed heads to see that those seeds are filled. And, and then, very importantly, you've got to provide a niche for that seed to grow in. If you don't do that, that's what I did. I didn't, I didn't provide a niche. I produced good seed, but I didn't provide a niche for that seed to actually to germinate in. Equally, at the same time, you've got to minimise the amount of weed seed that you're actually going to, going to have. Because, you know, you've got some weeds there as well, stuff you don't necessarily want to have. So you've got to, you've got to find a method of minimising that weed seed. And that might be mowing it, it might be grazing it, it might be spraying it with, with herbicide. You know, it could be all sorts of those things. And then you've got to think about, you know, maybe before you actually get to that point, you've got to think about whether you should actually do something to improve the quantity of seed that's going to produce and the quality of the seed. And that might mean fertilising it. Deliberately, deliberately producing that seed so that it actually grows and you get more plants. Here's a, here's a nice example. This is uh, weeping rice grass. We're clearly at a block with the cedar. You know, I, had a, I had a problem with my, my seeding equipment and, and that particular you know, little, little plot and there was nothing sown or just one, one, one maybe two got, got established. All, all we did in this case, once we recognised we had an issue, was to get the back of a rake, just run it down, create a little trench. Did nothing more than that. Now the seed that was produced by these plants simply washed into, those, into that line. Now, had we done nothing, that seed would have washed off the plot. But because we created this little niche, we got a whole lot of germination within it. The seed stayed put. You've got it exactly. Perfect. Swap. <laughs> yeah. yeah, fantastic. That's exactly right. Do something. Create a niche. Maybe get, maybe get your horses and run them, you know, do dressage on them. You know, do, do something. Disturb that soil. Disturb the, the, the top so that you've actually got a little place where the seed can fall and stay. Yeah. It, it, it's really simple. But you, know, you, you, can, you can often find uh, a, a disc plough, just arrange the coulter so they're straight rather than on an angle. So you know, have it straight, so they're just cutting, cutting little trenches. And just go over, the, go over the stand with that. All you're doing is you, you just need to create a little niche for the seed to fall in. Here's another case. Old weeping rice grass plants, cracks in the soil just a crack in the soil. And look how much it's recruited into that. It doesn't take much. You just need to create that little niche. In this case, it was done for me, so it was pretty easy. Kangaroo grass. What a classic this is. You know, there's just soil, just a little crack in the soil, and the, the seed has found its own way in. This, oh, this is, a, this is a, has anyone ever played with this seed? It's just a U-butte. It's just fantastic what it'll do. Got this wonderful lawn that sort of wriggles it around, wriggles it around, and, and will actually move substantial distances, find a place, and then drop in. And, you, and you've got this. And of course, the year after we had germination, through those patches, through those lines. Now, artificially we can create that. I'm sorry, Jenna. But artificially we can create that by, by just cutting a little trench, getting Bob's little... No, little tool or getting your, your disc plough. You no, no, I'm, not, I'm talking you know, half, you know, half a centimetre, you know, five mils. Just something to stop the seed. So I was just thinking uh, with barley grass, you get the problems of um, getting in the horse's gums. It's not to get 
Sorry, no, 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 no. I don't. I don't think. Uh, I've never heard of things like kangaroo grass or spear grass or whatever, which have that sort of thing causing issues for horses. Occasionally, I, I've never heard of kangaroo grass having issues for that with seed like that. Spear grass, I know for for uh, for sheep can be a problem because it gets stuck in the wool. But, but I've never heard it for horses. Saying you're getting good seed. How do you tell when the seed's ready? Because I'm thinking I've got one little patch on my side, but on the roadside there's actually quite a lot. How do I know when to harvest that? Which species? Oh, wallaby grass. Wallaby don't grass. Ask me which one? All right. So if no, that's okay. If if you imagine your seed head is like that, you know the, the ground being here, seed head sitting up there, you know it's a white fluffy seed head. Yeah. The it will always ripen from the top one down. So the, that will be ripened first. Don't, if you're gonna go and harvest the seed, wait till the first few have, few have dropped off and then go and harvest it. Because you know, you're aiming for the majority. So you've got a panicle that's about that long and you probably might have 15, 20 potential seeds in that and they'll ripen over about a um, you know, three week period. So you're aiming for about the middle section. You know, so you're just trying to get the maximum. And so, you, when they look plump. sorry. When they look plump. Well, not just when they look plump, but when they start, you see a, see a couple fall off. You look on the ground, you see a bit of seed on the ground. That's that's one. And then secondly, you can tear them up, up, and and you can you can sort of find that there's a nice little golden seed inside. Always, you, you, your thumb is a useful thing. The thumbnail, and get a bit of seed and just squeeze it between your finger and thumb. And and if, if it's if it's solid and it's not not soft, then then you're you're in you're in the game. Uh, once once you've harvested it, uh, the, I I just tend to throw it out on tar for a little while just to just let it dry, and that also lets all the spiders and other stuff that you harvest at the same time go away. Yeah, so you, you just gets you just leave it out for a little while. Uh, silky bluegrass is one that we haven't talked about, but it's, a, it's another one grows in the area here. And the point of this photo is to really is not so much about the big tall grass there, but all their seedlings. You know, it, it's, it's just doing that all from recruitment. Recruitment's a great method. You don't need to have masses of plants Necessarily, you know, it's great if you can start with lots of plants, but if, if you if you have a few, you can you can go about the bulking up process. But you've got to do something. Doing nothing won't give you anything. That's all. That's pretty old sort of stuff, isn't it? But you know, that you've got to do something to create the opportunity for these you know these plants to recruit. How am I going for time, by the way? I think I'm about about on my last slide. Uh, or second last, or third last, or something like that. Uh, wallaby grass is you know, recruitment again. You know, we got mature, mature plants. The, in this case, where there was no mulch, we don't have any seedlings. Where there is mulch, we've got seedlings. So in this case, it's just simply the mulch is providing the method by, to keep it in place. And that is my last slide. Yeah. Thank you.